commission of inquiry into the death of historian Dr. Walter Rodney began on April 28, 2014 at the Supreme Court Library. The commission is headed by Sir Richard Cheltenham and comprised Ms. Jacqueline samuels Brown and Mrs. Sinat Jairam. The lead counsel is Glenn Hanneman, assisted by attorneys at law Nicola Pierre and Lakshmi Rahamat. Representing the interests of the People's National Congress are attorneys at law Basil Williams, Joseph Harmon and James Bond. Dr. Rodney was killed on June 13, 1980, when a bomb exploded in the car in which he was sitting. He was 38 years old at the time. The first witness to testify was Crime Chief Leslie James, who turned over six files on Dr. Rodney and the Working People's Alliance to the commissioners. However, it was noted that seven of the files were missing. Mr. James, the special branch files which you tendered a bit earlier today had markings on the cover Working People's Alliance 8, Working People's Alliance 9, Working People's Alliance 10. That's correct. Could you please indicate at this time whether that numbering system started at 1 at any point in time? Yes, that would have been because it's done in uh, sequential order. And or numerical order. Sequential or numerical order. Yes. And by that you mean that there would have been Working People's Alliance 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7? That's correct. When you made your checks, Mr. James, in relation to any documents pertaining to Walter Rodney kept, or any reports kept by the um, special branch, were you able to locate volumes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7? That's negative, man. Does that mean he wasn't able to locate them? Could you explain what you mean by negative? Oh, my apologies. I should say no, I didn't find those files. I've checked and they weren't there. Can you state exactly what time period those particular volumes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, may have covered? I'm, I'm not sure because I, I haven't seen them. The files handed over to the Commission were dated 1980, and the previous files would have been dated prior to that. James had joined the police force in February 1987 and worked his way up to the special branch in 2012. He was appointed crime chief in 2014. James also produced an arrest warrant which was issued by Detective Frederick Caesar in June 1996 for the ex-GDF Sergeant Gregory Smith for the murder of Dr. Rodney. James is to return during the second session of the hearings to be cross-examined. Day two of the public hearings saw two very important witnesses come forward with explosive testimony by Lawrence Edward Rodney, the brother of the deceased, and Miss Karen D'Souza. Testimony from both created a link among the House of Israel an intimidatory police force, and the then ruling People's National Congress. The House of Israel, as an organization, any time they came out into the public, the posture was of such that it was very clear that they were there as strong loyalists of the ruling party. That is as far as one could go in terms of being political. The posture that they had, their public demeanor, was of such. There was no doubt whatsoever that they had loyalties to any other political organization other than the People's National Congress. These multiple postures, and the multiple postures of which he's speaking about were reflected in one. Breaking up meetings in the one. Another. Can you elaborate yes, on the, the, learned, the learned um, chairman has a point. By posture, it is meant, for example, shouting slogans, or down with the WPA, or down with... Give us with an example of some of the slogans. Well, you know, these are rhetoric, rhetorical. I mean, it could be anything. Down with the WPA. We don't want Rodney. Rodney this, Rodney. You know, rhetorical, rhetorical things. Give us an example of some of the slogans that you could, that may have stood out. But that is exactly what he's doing, Councillor. Yeah, he did give us two. You don't want Rodney. Yeah. Are there any more examples that you can give us? 
No, not really. I mean, I'm trying to be as accurate as possible. I'm we trying to put it that. in a particular context, whereby it's not blurred. We don't want it to be blurred. Um, for example, there would be meetings held, let us say, in Border Green. As you approach Border Green, you would hear people speaking. And these would be people speaking against the WP. But there would be people not in uniform, not in the, WP, not in the House of Israel uniform. So you have to assume that they're either supporters of the House of Israel or supporters of the PNC or both. But when you got to the meeting itself, on site, then is where you came in contact directly with the House of Israel, out of uniform. So there's a two parallels you have to look at. The approach as you get to the meetings and what actually took place once the meeting is taking place. Especially if the meeting is being very popular and the people are clapping and showing a claim. Because they didn't want that. The purpose was to disrupt meetings of the opposition. You didn't notice the members of the House of Israel clapping? Not really. Are these what? The, uh, no, no, they wouldn't they would applaud. They wouldn't applaud. Approximately how many meetings would you say you attended for the Working People's Alliance in the year 1979? A rough figure. I, I don't know. Um, lots. A lot. Yeah. Now, while you were present at any of these meetings, Ms. D'Souza, were there any interruptions of those meetings? Yes. Could you describe to the members of the commission some of these disruptions that would have taken place in your presence? Uh, some of the meetings were broken up by a unit of the police that we called at that time the death squad. Uh, some of the meetings were broken up. These would be mainly meetings in Georgetown were broken up by um, a group called the House of Israel. Now you refer to the death squad of the police. That would be a squad attached to which police force? The Guyana Police Force. And was there anything distinct about the death squad that differentiated them from other ranks of the Guyana Police Force? They were plain clothes and they were particularly vicious. Ms. Souza, just for the record, we did not get your last answer. I said they wore plain clothes and they were particularly vicious. Would you care at this time, Ms. Souza, to explain to the members of the commission what you mean by they were vicious? The attacks by the death squad tended to be, uh, they, they tended to be armed with hockey sticks, with police batons, um, and they seemed not to have no problem with using these on people who were unarmed. And when you say using them, what did you observe them doing with these hockey sticks and batons? Hitting. At this time, are you able to identify from your memory any names of persons known to you as being a member of the death squad? The one name that I remember is Fanfare. And is there any particular memory that you have of an incident regarding Fanfare? Not really, no. You also mentioned during your evidence earlier that the members of the House of Israel would disrupt meetings. Correct. Is there any particular means by which you were able to differentiate the members of the House of Israel from, say, the members of the death squad? Sometimes they were dressed in the House of Israel uniform. And could you please just explain to us what those uniforms were, either by color? It was um, uh, red, green, black. D'Souza also stated that when she saw Dr. Rodney's body, her thought was that he was finally killed by the PNC. This she attributed to the fact that two other members of the WPA were also killed, both shot by the police, Oheni Oama in Shirleyfield Ridley Square and Edward Dublin in Linden. She told the commission that no one was ever charged for these killings. 
You told us today, my opinion and answer to council was that he had finally been killed by members of the government. And then I, I see at page 18 of your testimony before the coroner. Um, I think it was Mr. Rex McKay was asking you a question on Mackay. Page 18, almost the uh, third line from the, the fourth line from the top. Is it correct to say that even after you saw the flesh and boneless remains of your leader, you did not ask Donald what uh, Donald, did not ask Donald how did that happen, and you said no. It seems to be an unusual uh, reaction for a human being. Could you just uh, explain why you didn't ask him? I, I think I think um, thinking back, the the. It just seemed as though it, it really did not matter what had happened. The fact was that Walter was dead, and this was this was really serious. This is this is devastation. This is all kinds of things. Um, what had happened at that point? No, it's 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 not a question. I was. I don't know. I don't even know if, if Donald would have been capable of answering it. I, I certainly was not capable of asking it. You, you, you were expecting it? Were you expecting it to happen? I think we were all kind of living with the expectation that it might happen to Walter or to any of us. On day three of the hearings, Reverend Reuben Gilbert confirmed what the two previous witnesses had stated, pointing out that he was personally victimized by the PNC leader who ensured that he was not employed by the state. This led him to seek the assistance of then-opposition leader Dr. Chedi Jagan, who, after several phone calls, secured a teaching job for the Reverend through the assistance of the chief education officer. The commission heard of the Reverend's beatings by members of the death squad while incarcerated and the false charge laid against him. All this persecution led Reverend Gilbert to flee Guyana. Meanwhile, attorney at law Basil Williams charged the commission for the suspension of Guyanese laws and allowing evidence that would otherwise be inadmissible in a local court. He raised the objection while the commission was admitting into evidence two books presented by witness Reverend Reuben Gilbert. People could come in here and bring in all of those things. What the, I hope when the time comes, there's no attempt to interfere with them and, and object. Because right now, it's basically with respect, we have suspended our rules of evidence, we suspended everything as a free fraud. But witnesses are going to come here and they're going to implicate people. So let's hope we don't have any objections when the time arises. Mr. William. Yes, sir. I think. You have not thought through that statement. We have not suspended the laws. We are bound by the laws. But a commission of inquiry, if you read all the literature, and I have taken the trouble to work with three books, I was leading counsel to a very controversial commission in Trinidad. A commission of inquiry can make its rules. Yes, Mr. And if you, and if you one moment, please, you are making a very serious statement and it reflects very badly on us. I take. Uh, Personally, I take umbrage to your statement. I don't put what in my mouth to say things, you know. I, 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 because I don't think you're being fair to us. If you, if you go back to the history, when the chairman made his opening speech, he referred to a statement by Lord Denning. And I'm sure you are a very experienced practitioner. When you look at the authorities, ancient and modern, a body such as the Commission of Inquiries entitled to make its own rules. We have published the rules. And you know, we have been telling you ad nauseum that we admit things the Benny see, and one has to appreciate the long term of what we're dealing with, and we will sift it and determine the relevance. I am sure, being the experienced counsel that you are, you would have had some appreciation of um, um, Mr. Reverend Gilbert it seems to be very um, he seems to be struggling with his health and, and everything else. So I, I don't think you're being charged, but we have not suspended the laws. Of, and, and speaking for myself, 
I have not suspended the laws of Guyana. So I want to make that clear to you. However, Williams maintained his position disregarding the commissioner's explanations, pointing out that while the commission can make rules, those rules cannot eradicate the rights of Guyanese, as he pointed to what he termed other inadmissible evidence, hearsay, opinions and beliefs, which have thus far been allowed. Mr. Chairman, you have in this commission people saying, I think this person killed this person. I think this person is a member of that organization. And what is that? In, a, in under our law, that is inadmissible evidence. In my opinion, the PNC killed this person. In my opinion, these were YSM. Nothing that is inadmissible in a court of law in this country. Yes, but it is not inadmissible here. No, but we will I, determine whether any way at all should be attached to those statements. Well, Mr. Chairman, when you, by the time you do that, this has international coverage and people's names that have been called have been sullied and they destroyed perhaps for eternity. I and that cannot be fair to the Guyanese people. Mr. Williams, I was very careful to devote a paragraph or more to the dangers of commissions of inquiry and how sometimes reputations can be destroyed. I warned against all of that. But in a commission like this, I fear it may be inevitable. Williams remained unmoved by the explanations and went on to cross-examine Reverend Gilbert with a number of speculative questions. Williams also asked the commissioners to expunge all information presented by Reverend Gilbert that were not during the period 1978 to 1980, as stated in the terms of reference. Day four of the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry saw the continuation of testimony from two witnesses, Reverend Reuben Gilbert and Lawrence Rodney, the brother of the late Dr. Walter Rodney. Williams continued his cross-examination of Reverend Gilbert, who maintained that he was victimized by the PNC, even as Williams questioned why he remained working with the ministry between 1971 to 1979. I'm asking you whether you felt that the, it was the PNC, in the party in government, that was um, preventing you from obtaining a job? The, the actions were quite clear to Is me. Is that a yes? Is that a yes? Yes. But not Mr. Bordeaux. What about Mr. Barnum? You're not blaming him too. Well, Mr. Barnum was the head of the country. And oh. the people who were acting under his direction. Okay, I see. In fact, let me say this. When I was taken in, in the vehicle, one of the, those in the vehicle said to the other, I don't know why Bornham don't give us the option to get, get rid of him. Well, why so you it dawned on me that at, up to that time, they had not a, any instruction to kill me. Well, why don't you say that when you give your evidence to Mr. Um, it's, to it's, Mr. It's um, not, it, Hanuman? It, there's a lot of things that um, you, you, if you have to put them in, 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 in a statement, you will be writing very copiously. Gilbert's statement, which has been submitted to the Commission, states that when he did not get work, he visited then opposition leader Dr. Cherry Jagan, who made calls, and when he did threatened, he would take the matter to the United Nations. It was after that Gilbert was sent to Mr. Agard of the Ministry of Education. You said in your evidence that when you came back, you, you, you saw the society was polarized. Remember? And fearful. Good. Now, polarized could only mean along racial lines. No, no, it doesn't mean, only mean racial lines. Yeah, but it includes that. Polarized, polarized by true politics. All right, In but it included racism. Maybe. That's not my Maybe. conclusion. And it's not, was it not? Well, for a black person to be in the PPP when you came back and an Indian person to be in the PNC when you came back, weren't they nasty terms to describe people of that nature? They called you a crab dog. And an Asian person here, there was a Hindu term of Neem the Karam. Isn't that so? I heard that. So you were being called crab dog when you came back, and such just because you were perceived to be 
a PPP, and people probably felt you shouldn't be in the in that party as a black person. Isn't that so? I was not in the PPP when I. No, came. you didn't perceive. You're writing in the mirror. It's one. You visit in the bookshop. One article I wrote during the period we're talking about. Lawrence Rodney also continued his evidence, giving a background of the political atmosphere from 1972 to 1980, which he stated was a dictatorship. Speaking from his experience of walkie-talkies through his experience in the Royal Air Force as a signals officer, he said there was no way that the one that caused the explosion which killed his brother could have been used for the purpose of a walkie-talkie. It had to have been used as an explosive device. Learning comes to when I saw the body, I recognized that from the appearance of the torso, that this had been an explosion caused by a detonation of some kind. I didn't know what it was, if it had been, as people subsequently said, a walkie-talkie or whatever device. However, it was consistent with something called an anti-personal device. API, they call it API. Now these are the kind of devices that either are thrown, if they can be thrown accurately, or planted in a vehicle, or in a bookcase, or in an office, or sent through the mail. It is used regularly, or was in the past, by the PD and by other intelligence services engaged in struggling against the Africans in Guinea, Mozambique, and to a lesser extent, Angola. In other words, it was a bomb that they killed. Additionally, subsequently, and based on my own experience with the APIs, I came to understand that it was not a walkie-talkie as such. It was what was called a place bow. A place bow is a device which is not what it pretends to be. The radio set or whatever it was concealed an explosive device. You don't have a walkie-talkie and send a message to kill someone. You know, send a message and get killed. A walkie-talkie is to communicate. That place bow device concealed within it a very ingenious insertion of a bomb. Lawrence also lamented the fact that his organization, the Working People's Vanguard Party, was working towards having workers unionized, being given their rights, and not being taken advantage of by the system. He insisted that it was the system that the WPVA was trying to change, either by an electoral process or a non-electoral process. PNC was on the siege. In terms of a coalition, a political coalition, yes. Because don't, I'm not accepting what you're saying, it was just the PPP and the WP. There were a number of other parties. But in terms of what you just said, yes. It considered itself under siege. Your brother believed, and the new academic elite at that time, that the government at the time should go. I'm sorry, you were still at university, no council. You hadn't become... In the 1970s? Oh, in the 70s. That's, the, that's the period we had. Okay, thank you. I missed the entire era. I never even met Dr. Walter Rand. Yes. I don't think he's answered that yet. No, he hasn't. Yes. If you're referring to the period of 1974, or you're referring to the period of 1978, 79, I'd like you to be specific. Before I answer. Before I answer. Yeah, take your time. No. Are you referring to 1974 when the WPA had even formed itself as yet and was based on a coalition? Or you refer to 1978-79 after Rodney said that the government must go by all means. Which, well, which period? 
Well, the tax has appeared, we know, up to 78, 79. Okay, I, yes. I, we yes. talked about Gawa and the PPP. They're the main opposition party. They had political activities, they had strikes, all those things. Then into that entered the WPA. Dr. Rodney and his, and his academic elite. Dr. Omar Wale, uh, everybody was a doctor. We are focusing now on their baby. Yes. You agree that? Dr. Walter Rodney, Dr. Omar Wale, Dr. Rupert Rupnarai, all the bright boys. I won't answer that question in the affirmative because what you're implying is that the Working People's Alliance, which was based on a coalition of parties and groups, was just Dr. Rodney and the academic elite. No, I'm not suggesting that. I, what I gave you were mainly illustrations. It, it, it but that exhaustive. illustration council is false. It wasn't exhaustive. I'm saying to you that they were among the three. They were among, those three were among the activists yes, of the WPA. Were. Yes, they were. And as I said earlier, they were very sure that Forbes Burnham and his government were old time. They were very sure that Forbes Burnham and, and his government were... Were past the time. They were obsolete. They, and were, they, they were certain it was a dictatorship and it should be overthrown. No, well, if you say that. Meanwhile, at the end of the day's standing, several lawyers were granted standing to participate in the inquiry. The lawyers will represent the widow, children, and brother of the late Dr. Walter Rodney and head of the Guyana Trades Union Congress, GTUC, Lincoln Lewis. One who works in Canada, Mr. Peters. We had Mr. Clark, who are representing the interests of the Guyana Trade Union. That is a very large organization. The Secretariat had received documents from the said lawyers seeking standing and today that standing was officially granted. The person who will come to the witness box and give evidence on behalf of that is one Lincoln Lewis. We look forward to hearing Mr. Lewis's testimony in the coming sessions of the Walter Rodney sitting. We also have the family of the deceased. The widow and the children of Walter Rodney are being represented by Mr. Pilgrim and he was also granted standing before the commission. We have Donald Rodney whose name has been coming up since this incident first took place in that he was actually in the car with Walter Rodney on the date in question. He is now being represented by Mr. Scotland, who was also granted standing before the Commission. As I said on the last occasion, we did an interview. We welcome participation from all parties concerned. The Rodneys, more so, are very intimately connected with this Walter Rodney Commission because it was Mrs. Rodney's letter to the president that triggered this whole process starting. May 2, 2014, culminated the first round of hearings, which started on Monday, April 28. The next round of hearings will commence on May 27 and run until June 6. Dr. Walter Rodney, a Guyanese political activist and intellectual, died on June 30, 1980, following an explosion in his car. He is believed to have been murdered and had written several books prior to his untimely demise. The COI, among other things, will inquire who or what was responsible for the explosion that led to Rodney's death, whether it was an accident or an act of terrorism, and the role of some persons and agencies, if any, in his death. Rahamat stressed the importance of the evidence tendered by Crime Chief Leslie James, who produced documents never seen before. He is one of the most important witnesses, I believe, that came this week. We have to remember that the crime chief brought to the Walter Rodney Commission documents that have never been seen before. We have three folders that are packed with surveillance reports that were done by the special branch back in 1980. We also have other documents in relation to the Walter Rodney file, which is in relation to his death, 
done by the police and the investigation that was carried out and all the evidence that was taken is in that file. We also have a third file that was tendered by Mr. James in relation to a murder charge that was instituted sometime in 1996 against Gregory Smith. Mr. James is one witness in particular who I am actually looking forward to being completed because even though he was not around back in 1980 and he was not part of the investigation surrounding the death of Walter Rodney, he stands in the position where he is the crime chief and where he left special branch just before obtaining that office and actually has brought these documents that were never available for public viewing. So even though he didn't have an intimate connection with the incident and or the following in investigations that flow, he is the man who will have to answer questions in relation to, you know, why was the special branch monitoring the WPA? And some of the reports on the surveillance has instructions that were given and what was done pursuant to those instructions. So he stands there having to defend some of the actions that may have been taken by policemen within the organization because he is part of the organization. The second session will see nine days of hearings, which could be extended if necessary, with the addition of more lawyers who would be seeking evidence. Expected to come forward during that period are Yusi Kwayana and Rupert Rupnarine, along with Donald Rodney, who was in the car with his brother when the explosion occurred, which took his life. Additionally expected are the wife and children of the late historian.